to talk about something, I think the agenda says that I'm supposed to talk about how technology changes government. And I'm not sure that technology changes government. I think technology enables government, but uh, I, hopefully to do better, cheaper, faster things. But we're gonna talk about five different ways, uh, from my experience, that technology is having an impact on government. So um, I wanna first welcome you to CitySense. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. You're going to unfortunately see me again tomorrow. Uh, because I'm going to be welcoming you all over again, uh, but uh, hopefully you won't get too tired of me and we can uh, start uh, really uh, a couple of days of really intense conversations with a lot of good people. The World Bank. When I was at the White House, I really didn't know what the World Bank did. And it's, it's come to uh, be a really important lesson for me to know that the World Bank has two primary goals, to eradicate extreme poverty in the world and raise economic prosperity for the bottom 40% of all developing countries. Talk about stretch goals. But what the World Bank is coming to know is that if it is to reach those very aggressive but doable goals, it cannot do it without the transformative power of technology. It cannot embed technology in various forms, including the traditional information and communications technology in its DNA, in its soul, if it's, if it's going to achieve its objectives. Because we know what doesn't work. We know that that top-down approach doesn't work, but we are beginning to understand that what we need to do is add the bottoms-up approach or the side-in approach to really be co-creators of solutions with all participants in the ecosystem in which governments work. So that's really uh, what I'm here to talk about because I think this captures, in many sense, senses, what, what we're really talking about here. This is by Mike Bracken, who runs the delivery unit of the UK government. And what he says is, in an analog world, policy dictates delivery. But today, in a digital world, delivery informs policy. What that means is that we need to reorder how governments work. Because governments, and I'm a recovering government bureaucrat myself, governments work by coming up with a policy. We spend hours and hours and hours talking about policy and big thoughts, and we come up with these statements, and then we start worrying about how it's actually going to be implemented. What this statement suggests is that we reverse that. We actually start by thinking about small solutions and iteratively develop them and as we do that, we come up with information, knowledge, that then shapes a better policy, a better law. And that is enabled by technology. So, I'm gonna give you, as I promised, five problem statements, if you will, and five solution statements. Number one, technology is without a doubt creating and increasing complexity in our lives and in our government lives but it is also creating an opportunity for government to change, to actually become a platform to allow the delivery of better services, products and services. Because there's never going to be enough time, there's never gonna be enough money, there's never gonna be enough technology that a city can buy to actually solve the problems that they face and the demands of citizens. The only way I know, again, as a recovering bureaucrat, is to allow a co-creation process to open up, to allow the community to be the capacity that the government just doesn't have. I put together this slide because I joined the city of San Francisco in about 2001. And I wanted to understand in my uh, tenure as first CIO of San Francisco and then White House and now at the World Bank, what has actually happened in the world from a technology standpoint? And when you look at this list and you understand what it looked like, what the world looked like in around 2000, 2001 and how it looks today and how many of these things have become embedded 
in our very soul. In fact, you're going to be hearing so much about how these things are being applied in, in follow-on speakers that you get a sense of the massive change that has happened in recent history and the complexity as a result of how we deal with this. Because here is the problem for government. You just saw an amazing timeline. And if you see kind of the, the curve up, the rest of the world is going like this and government kind of goes like this. And there are many reasons for that and we're not gonna talk about that today, but it's that gap that gap that becomes the, pro the problem. And the question that we have is, should government try to do that, that uh, ramp up? Or should we try another way to close the gap? Oftentimes, when we talk about government as a platform, we, we talk about data. And that government releases data, and that is the asset that we give away so that the public sector, the private sector, the citizen sector can take it and create value. And um, I, was, I was told to give you examples from my past. So this is one from the White House where we created data.gov, as many governments do, is nothing new in creating a data uh, catalog for others to use. But what's interesting about this one, it's called data.communities. What we did is we reached down to the city level in the United States context, the community level, and also the national level. And in one place, we created a, a, an opportunity for developers or citizens to actually see the data at all levels of government. And from that, we can actually start the process of creating solutions that are not just city-specific or just national-specific, but service-specific that will address citizens' problems because we know that citizens don't care whether a need is met by the federal government or local government. What they want is just it to be met. And so this was our attempt to start that process about creating an integrated approach. This is also a US example. And this example is important because um, in the United States, uh, the upper northeast part of the country faced a hurricane of devastating proportions um, about a year ago. And it so overwhelmed the government that they simply could not provide the information to the citizens. And I show this slide because one of the best things that it did is it opened up that data, but it allowed citizens, and in the case of this particular example, kids to use Twitter to basically communicate to various neighborhoods in various cities where open gas stations were and basically created a community. And a community so active, it, uh, Twitter shut it down because it didn't think it would, knew what it was doing and thought it was doing bad things. But we, the White House, stepped in and actually got Twitter to open it back up. And it became the single lifeline for hundreds of residents who needed gasoline. Number two, uh, technology disrupts. There's no question about that. Um, but I think one of the, the disruptions that has the most potential is this idea of real-time everything. What we're talking about here now is the opportunity for real-time data to make real-time decision-making with real-time impact and always important for us in development or government, real-time management and evaluation. I'd like to use the cell phone phenomena as an example. We know that there are 6.8 billion cell phone subscriptions in this world, 6.8 billion. And we know, though, that not everybody has a smartphone. Oftentimes, and this is an actual case of a project in the World Bank, where we're not using smartphones, we're using um, featureless phones. And it's not that we have them ourselves, they actually hang from a tree and get used by citizens on a community basis. But cell phones have become such an important part of communication and actually government that we wanted to test something out. And in that middle picture there, you really can't see it in this slide, but in Uganda, bananas, something I learned, are the, most, the single most important export of the country and the second most important foodstuff for the Ugandans. The entire banana crop 
in Uganda is about to be wiped out by a blight. The government, through its extension, ag extension workers, have been telling the farmers to cut down the tree and bury it as the way to stop the blight. Some perverse logic in there. When actually, if any of you grow orchids, you know that you're supposed to sterilize the cutting instruments when you trim the particular plant, which is what should be happening here. So essentially, the government is giving information that is going to destroy the number one export of the entire country. We knew that that wasn't the case, so in agreement with the country, we did a pilot project with UNICEF, because UNICEF had already reached out to 200,000 Ugandans and developed a relationship, a texting relationship with them. So we did a simple thing. We said to all 200,000, do you or anybody you know suffer from the blight? Yes or no? Within 24 hours, we got 45,000 responses to that question. Enough to create the first ever heat map of where the blight exists and where it doesn't, and gave that to the government. But moving on beyond that, we said, do you want to know how to, how to solve it, yes or no? And we, this time, we didn't even wait for the response. We just sent the information out. And within 25, uh, 24 hours, another 25,000 had participated in the conversation. We are now testing whether this experiment has actually changed the behavior of the farmers. And why we're not done with this study, early results suggest that we have indeed gotten over that hump that we are indeed helping the farmers to basically recreate the solution that government was giving them and actually create the right solution. From my uh, San Francisco days, this is another example. Uh, this one from a government perspective and this one where sensor data in both streets and also in park, uh, parking spaces and garages is allowing the government to actually know where vacant spaces are, where people are using, and actually raise or lower the price of parking in San Francisco as a way to move people to places that are available and um, to also uh, ease congestion. Number three, individual empowerment and individual empowerment. In addition to what Mike said, to me, the single most important thing that technology is doing is enabling or empowering the individual to have more control, to have more power, to actively manage their lives. If you think about what Cisco says in the Internet of Things, that by 2020, I think there were supposed to be 20 billion connections to the internet. By 2030, another 50 billion. If you look at the rise of cell phones, what we talked about, if you look at um, social networking, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, if you look at the rise of big data, and I hear we're gonna talk about little data uh, in a bit, but if you look at that and you look at what we just witnessed here in Barcelona, which was the use of 3D printers, all of that technology, all of that revolution is actually helping the individual take control of their life. And that individual empowerment raises significant issues for large organizations like the World Bank, but even more significant questions about the role of government and the ability or rightful uh, uh, governing of individuals. It also gets used to hold people like the World, or organizations like the World Bank accountable. This is actually an example of a project that we worked in in Nigeria, where we actually built a system, a feedback system, if you will, for the recipients of donor aid like World Bank to actually report back to us whether what we thought we were giving aid for was actually available to the citizen and able to be used. Four, complexity again, and how to leverage 
the ecosystem. Ecosystem is one of those words right now that we all talk about. It's this fancy word of just understanding all the various players that are important in whatever problem we're trying to solve. This is an example. This is a picture, one picture of that ecosystem. You've got government, you've got private sector, academia, and civil society organizations. And what we're arguing is that in the middle of that, you need some kind of fab lab, living lab, a place for all players to come together and actually experiment in the co-creation of solution delivery. Um, I, I said that we were uh, in, at the fab lab in Barcelona this morning. What was really fascinating this morning, and this is a true story, is the, uh, one of the deputy mayors of Barcelona told me a, a story about 3D printing. He said that they had been contacted by the Solomon Islands. And the Solomon Islands only get two ships arriving a year. But what they'd done is asked the city of Barcelona Fab Lab to help them get 3D printers. Because what they wanted to do is take those printers and actually use them to create the products and services they need, but also to help them create businesses and individual uh, um, ecosystems so that the people living in the Solomon Islands didn't have to worry about when the next shipment was coming. This is an example, uh, a more complex example, of facilitating a local innovation ecosystem in Lebanon. Interestingly enough, the World Bank finds itself helping war-torn or what we call fragile states. That may be South Sudan, that may be Iraq, that may be Lebanon in this case. And what we're trying to do is help these countries and the governments within them understand that if they're going to create solutions, prob uh, products and services that will meet the needs of their citizens, again, all of the players need to be there, but they need to think about, in this case, the fundamentals, how you provide connectivity to the citizens. And I thought this might be an interesting way of showing that it involves so many different people, but it can include uh, mobile operators, incubators, accelerators, universities, et cetera. And the last one, <laughs> perfection and process innovation. We have learned, and maybe because I'm from California originally, the idea of kind of that lean startup approach to government, to development. In government, we usually do these big RFPs where we try to anticipate everything that's gonna happen and we write these complex RFPs, RFQs, RFXs, and then we spend years kind of going through them, qualifying vendors, coming up with the solution. And by the time we do all that, inevitably the solution doesn't work the problem has changed, and government is left with this complex thing. What we're arguing is that that needs to change. And that what we do is we don't, it's kind of like Mike said, we don't start with this big problem, a solution, we actually start little. And we you know, develop that minimum viable product, and that we do rapid prototyping, and make sure that the customer is in the center of all that we do. And then, once we find what works in order to scale it up, we have to find you know, development partners, we need to mainstream the product, and we need to uh, prototype to impact, because a lot of times what we do in our world, and especially in government, we love this concept of pilot projects. We're gonna test it out, we're gonna do this pilot project. The problem is that government is littered with pilot projects that have failed, or even sometimes succeeded, but the problem is that we never do anything with it. If we can change the paradigm, and if we can start small, rapidly build, and then scale, we can address that particular issue. This is something that the bank did, and I cannot take any credit for this. Uh, the team who is here can. But what I want to talk about is that we did at the bank this hackathon that was both the traditional hackathon as well as a hackathon at home. And for over a year, we looked at the problems of sanitation and how they can be fixed. And we did end up with the shiny little apps at the end of the process. 
But what's more important in this case is that in front, we actually spent most of our time talking about the problem statement. In fact, we spent so much time that we, in, we involved so many people that 90% of our time was just about the problem statement. And in the end, came up with literally hundreds of problem statements, both from a problem as well as an impact as well as an outcome perspective, that the government was able to not only um, participate in the hackathon, but actually create a multiple set of solutions based on just better understanding the problem. One last thought. Last week um, in Washington, we had something called ICT Russia Week. We had the Minister of ICT and Mass Communications come to Washington along with 40 of his uh, senior advisors, and we talked about the challenges of government in this complex world that I've just described. And it was fascinating to me to hear him compare a very different political system, but the number one problem he had was the same problem I had in San Francisco, the same problem I have had in Washington, D.C., and to a certain extent, the same problem I have in the World Bank, and that's culture change. How do you actually take all of this goodness, the technology I've just spent talking about, actually brings to government, how do you actually change the ser civil servant, the bureaucrat, the person whose job it is not to do what you've just been describing? Um, this slide is from our, our work, again, the team's work in um, Colombia. But I think the bottom line is that you need to show somebody how it actually helps his or her life get better, whether that's a personal life or whether that's a work life. It sounds so trite and it sounds so simplistic and it also is pretty darn difficult when you're trying to do this at scale. But I think the issue, uh, and back to the Fab Lab in Barcelona example, if you could have been there, you would have seen about 20, 25 students working to develop and build these um, 3D printers. And what they have decided to do is they've decided to create a 3D printer in a suitcase. And what they're going to do is they're actually going to go out to the retirement homes, to the cafes, to the bars, to the businesses in their communities, and they're actually going to whip open that box, plug in the printer, and start creating things using that 3D printer to show, to directly show, the people they're meeting with, what can be accomplished. To me, that was one of the most important parts of what I saw in that innovation lab. It's the thought that you can do whatever you want in these fancy labs, but until you get out into the community and actually roll up your sleeves and actually do the dirty work of finding out what problems are and how you can help facilitate solutions, technology is worthless. It can't do anything until you use it to help people understand the change that is about to take place. So usually when I give this talk, I talk about open development. But again, that tagline that you see, that next generation of empowerment, or this one, innovation from within, ultimately, that's what we're talking about. And I've dedicated my life to figuring out how technology can make that happen. What you're going to see in the next nine presentations are really interesting, really fascinating, in some cases, really transformational changes as a result of this. So I hope you've enjoyed this foundation, and I hope that you enjoy even more the nine speakers that are coming up behind me because we're passionate about this and we believe we really are enabling the change of the world. Thank you.